Welcome and good morning. Well, the stone has been rolled away. The women run away from the tomb, frightened and amazed. Jesus appears to encourage the hearts of his disciples, confirming his resurrection and bringing peace. Even in the midst of these Easter events, doubt lingers. Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. In these words, Jesus speaks to his disciples and to each one of us. Therefore, in liturgy, song, and prayer, the church echoes Easter's resurrection thrill to a world ensnared in fear and doubt. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We raise our hearts and voices in worship.
We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in the entrance psalm for the day. Like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear God's word appointed for this day, the second Sunday of Easter. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 4. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is found in the first chapter of the first letter of John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. 
that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith to one another and to the world in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, it's time for our children's message. Great to see everybody here this morning. Hope you're having a wonderful time. Have you ever received something that gave you special joy, that made you wonderfully happy? Maybe it was a toy that you had been looking forward to having and, and really wanting, or maybe you got to 
visit someone or some place very special. Or maybe someone special came to visit you. I know that you've all had those kind of experiences. And I'm going to share one with you that someone shared with me. Uh, they talked about their grandma who came all the way from Germany to visit them at Easter. Wow. Well, I asked that individual, had you ever met her? Did she speak English? Did she teach you how to say anything in German? That must have been very exciting, right? And then I asked, what was the very best thing about finally meeting your grandma? And this person said, well, she made the best, some really good Easter cookies. Oh, what fun we had, that person said. And I asked, well, did you tell your friends about your grandma visiting? Did you invite your friends to have some? How did, you, how did your friends like them? Did that make them happy too? Now, when we think about your stories and the things that make you did the rest of you tell anyone about those things that made you especially happy? I'm sure you did. And then how did they react when you told them about something that made you happy? Well, they were happy for you too, weren't they? Maybe they even said something like, Oh, I'm so happy for you. And I'll bet their happiness at hearing about your happiness made you even happier. It's that kind of spreading happiness, of spreading of joy, that John talks about in our epistle lesson, our second reading from the Bible today. He's writing to people to tell them about his joy. And he's sure that they will also rejoice. And that will make his joy even greater. You see, John's joy is Jesus. Now, some people think about God as only being dark and, and selfish and angry and mean. But Jesus told us and showed us that God, His Father, is generous and forgiving and loving. In fact, Jesus showed us how loving God is when He did what the Father asked Him to do, to die on the cross to save us. And God is so loving that he raised Jesus from the dead and promised to raise us too. When we learn to know God as Jesus knows him, then that fills us with great joy. And when we tell someone about our joy in Jesus, and that person believes and receives that same joy, that makes our joy even greater, doesn't it? What a delightful thing it is, not to keep the joy to ourselves, but to share it with others. Let's ask Him to help us do that as we fold our hands and bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for sharing Your Son with us. Thank You for having Him die on the cross and rise from the grave so that our sins could be forgiven and we might have the gift of heaven. We are so happy to have that good news. And we want to share that with others. Help us to find the opportunities and take advantage of those times whenever we can share this good news with others around us so that they also may have this joy. We ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Now we continue with our worship service.
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation today is from our Gospel reading in John chapter 20. We pray, O Lord our God, I pray that the words of my lips and that the meditation of our hearts might be found to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, that we might be touched and healed by your love. Amen. And now in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Amen. Have you ever noticed that if you tell someone that there are 300 billion stars in the universe, they'll believe you. But if you tell them that a bench or a door or something else has just been painted and the paint is still wet, that same person has to touch it to make sure. Haven't you ever done that? Of course you have. We've all done it. It's the Thomas in us. Now, not the part of Thomas that doubted, but the part of Thomas that needed some tactile reassurance. Now, obviously, Thomas was a realist, and touch was important to Thomas. Touch helped him to remember all that Jesus had said and taught. And touch is important to us as well. For the very same reasons, touch helps us remember. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. And first, I, I want you to, to touch the things around you. Feel the smooth softness of, of the fabric of your dress or your pants. Now, compare that to the rougher feel of, of the pew cushion or the chair you're sitting in. Feel the smoothness of the finished wood. It's so different than the rough-hewn wood of the cross which Christ bore for us. Now, touch the pages of the hymnal or, or your bulletin. They certainly would feel different than the parchment or, or the animal skin of the Scriptures in the disciples' time. Now, think about the touch and the feel of certain things. Remember the feel of a puppy that feather-soft feel of that puppy's fur and the warm, wet feel of its tongue on your hand. Remember? Or what about the feel of your favorite toy? Maybe it was a doll. You can still feel the ruffles on the dress or the springy curls of that doll's hair. Maybe it was a Tonka truck. And you can still feel that cold smooth and the, that cold steel and, and the smoothness of that yellow paint. You can still feel the, the big, hard, rough rubber of those wheels. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Touch is an important part of life, isn't it? And we use the word touch in a number of different ways. Henny Youngman, a comedian from a long time ago, used to tell people, I have a very fine doctor. If you can't afford the operation, he touches up the x-rays. You see, touch is so important that We've incorporated all of its various nuances into the phrases we use every day. We tell each other to keep in touch because we don't want to lose touch. And of course, for years, the comp phone company tried to encourage us to use the phone by using the phrase, reach out and touch someone. We talk about people being a soft touch or having a soft touch. Some folks are just out of touch with reality. We talk about someone making repairs as touching it up a little. And when they're nearly finished, of course, they have put on the finishing touch. We talk about emotions as being touchy-feely. We use touch in a very negative way when talking about some situation we don't want to get involved in. I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. And it scares us if a doctor comes in and say, well... It's kind of touch and go right now. And we all know that a single word, a look, a gesture can touch off a, a serious event or, or touch off a certain emotion. And probably the most hated phrase in all of parenthood, especially while traveling, is the dreaded, Mom, he keeps touching me. But of course, Dad always had the magic touch. Because all dad had to say, all right, you two, don't make me stop this car. So you see, touch can evoke all kinds of memories. We've even established places where we can go to 
touch and remember places like the Vietnam Memorial, uh, the Merle Building, the Oklahoma City Memorial, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, or any graveyard where you can touch the headstones and trace the chiseled out names and dates. Sometimes we're touched by a simple story or an article we've read, received from a friend. You see, touch is a very important sense in our lives and in our emotions. It helps us remember. Touch became very important for Thomas. We don't know where he was when Jesus appeared to the other disciples. They were all behind locked doors. They had locked themselves in for fear that they might be arrested and tried like Jesus. And so there they were, locked in their room, locked in their confusion, wanting to believe, but having trouble making that leap of faith. And all of a sudden, there stood Jesus, like some holy jack-in-the-box. Jesus was suddenly there. After getting over their initial shock, they were excited. They were enthralled. They soaked up every second they could get. And when Jesus breathed on them, don't you know they breathed deep? Taking in all they could and then holding their breath as long as they could. They didn't want to miss a single ounce of that heavenly breath. But Thomas wasn't there. Where was he? Maybe he went out for locks and bagels. Huh? Did he have an early morning appointment, an evening appointment? Did he just have to get away and be by himself? Maybe he walked back to the tomb to look in and make sure he wasn't dreaming, that it really was empty. We don't know where Thomas went or what he was thinking. All we know for sure is that he wasn't there the first time Jesus appeared to the rest of the disciples. He wasn't there and he wasn't about to believe until he could reach out and actually touch Jesus and look at those wounds. Now, that's not so odd, is it? We know people who are the kind of folks who need proof. Maybe you're one of those kind of people. You need something concrete, something physical to hold on to so you can believe. It has to be proven to you. I think Jesus revealed himself in all these different and various resurrection experiences for a purpose. I think he showed himself in so many ways because we're all different and we all need different kinds of proof. Some folks can immediately believe on faith alone. Others, like Thomas, needed something a little more solid. Neither way is more right than the other. They're just different ways of looking at things. Jesus knew that. So about a week later, in the same house, in the same room, the disciples were gathered again. This time, Thomas was there. Jesus came, stood among them. He knew how Thomas was. He knew how, Jesus, uh, how Thomas thought. He even knew what Thomas said. So upon greeting Thomas, Jesus says, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt. Do not disbelieve. But believe. But you know what? Thomas didn't really need to touch Jesus. Upon seeing Jesus... Thomas believed and remembered. Thomas was touched by the master's willingness to be touched. Mary wanted to touch Jesus in the garden, but he wouldn't let her. And she must have shared that with the disciples. It was part of her story, part of her witness. It's recorded in Scripture. So obviously the early church thought it was important. But here, Jesus offers to let Thomas touch him. Jesus held out his hands and feet to prove who he is. He asked Thomas to put his hand in, his, in, his, in the side and, and feel the wound there. But Thomas didn't need to touch Jesus. All Thomas needed was to see the scars. I don't know if you've ever watched Antiques Roadshow. It's a PBS program. But if you have, then you know that when they examine a piece of fine silver, on it somewhere you will find little marks placed there by the jeweler or the manufacturer. You'll find initials or some other sign engraved on the bottom of the item or on the back side of a display object, or as is the case with rings on the inside of a band. Now, these, hall, these markings are called hallmarks. 
and they have that name because originally, many years ago, all items made of silver, whether pots, dishes, trays, utensils, jewelry, whatever, were produced by members of a guild or a union. Early on, all of the guild members lived and worked in the same complex. And at one time, the guild members both met and worked in the largest room of the guilds, the halls. Later on, those halls would become the meeting, the eating places, and the places where guild members would bring their, their work to be inspected by the masters of the guild. If it was deemed of good enough quality, it was marked with the mark of the guild hall and was called the hallmark. Hallmarks are etched or engraved into every item for two reasons. They tell us two things. The first reason is to show that the item is actually what it appears to be. That it is, in fact, an item made of pure silver, an item that's not mixed with other cheaper materials. The hallmark is a guarantee of quality and purity. The second thing a hallmark does is tell you where the product comes from. In other words, the hall or the guild that produced it and in some cases, which particular individual of that guild made it. Now, in England, hallmarks are not only composed of letters or initials. Often there's a crest of some sort in, incorporated into the markings, and especially that's the case in larger items. Uh, for example, if there's a leopard's head, that piece comes from London. If there's a castle, the silver came from Edinburgh. If there's a crown, it's the hallmark of the guild in Sheffield. If there is an anchor, it came from Birmingham. And if there are three wheat sheaves, then the silversmiths of Chester made it. All this business of hallmarks started in about the year 1300 when King Edward of England passed a law saying that no precious metal could be sold without a guarantee of its purity being marked on it. So from 1300 to this day, the practice of hallmarking has continued in one form or another. All right, so you're wondering, why this brief history lesson on hallmarks? Well, for Thomas, the scars of Jesus' crucifixion were God's hallmark on the most precious treasure of all time. The Son of God even bore a crest there on the crest of Calvary. That crest, of course, is the cross. The cross the scars mark of heaven. When we see the hallmark on a piece of silver, we know it's genuine. The scars serve the same function for Thomas. He didn't need to touch Jesus. He saw the hallmarking of the scars and knew Jesus was a genuine item. And he never doubted again. The sight of those scars took all his doubt away. We all have scars of our own. Some are on the outside physical scars of the pain and the trauma that our bodies have been through, scars from injuries. But some scars can't be seen. They can only be felt in the heart, in the spirit. No one else sees the scars we carry inside, the psychological, emotional, the, the spiritual scars that we carry are the scars that no one else can possibly see. But know this. Jesus sees those scars. He knows the pain they have caused you. He knows the doubt about others and about yourself that they have caused. Jesus knows because He sees and He feels those scars too. But know this also. Jesus carries those scars as well. His and ours. And the pain, the torment, the hurt, the devastation of what caused those scars was nailed to the cross with Christ. It died with Him and it was buried with Him. It was sealed away in the tomb. And the good news is that because it was sealed away in the tomb, it no longer has to plague you. Because it wasn't raised with Him. You were raised to new life with Christ. Not the things that cause you pain, but the things that offer life. You were raised to new life with Jesus, just like Thomas and the other disciples. Today, I invite you to come, to come like Thomas. I invite you to, to touch those tender places in your heart and in your memories. And I know that can be uncomfortable. 
But I want you to touch those places that have caused you pain and hurt. Touch those places and touch those scars. And then let Jesus touch them with his healing hands. Hands marked with the hallmark of heaven. Hands whose scars shout out God's love for us. Today, touch and be touched. Touch and be healed. Touch and be raised to new life in Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us now join our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, by the resurrection of your Son, you adopt all who believe in Him. Receive us as your newborn children and nourish our faith by the pure spiritual milk of your Word, that we may dwell in your presence forever. You have declared peace between God and man in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Receive our thanks for that authority given to your church on earth and grant that the ministers of your church would faithfully carry out their office, pronounce that free forgiveness of sins upon all repentant sinners. Merciful Father, as your people are united in the common life and love of our Savior, grant that we would share that life and that love with those in need. Your peace flows from that risen and glorified wounds of Christ through your church and into the lives of all your faithful people. Bless and direct Christian parents that your forgiveness would be freely shared in their homes, that each family would live together in your peace. Almighty God, you appoint rulers and officials for the sake of order and peace. Bless those you have placed in authority over us in federal, state, and local governments. Give to them the desire to serve with integrity and honor and to work for the benefit of all. Lord God, we praise your Son's resurrection from the dead and draw strength from His ascension before you, where He ever stands for us as, as our own High Priest. Especially do we bring before your throne of mercy and grace those that we name in our hearts at this moment. Graciously receive our prayers of intercession and hear them for His sake, Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, the Word of God was made flesh, suffered death, and is risen in victory. We ask that out of your indescribable grace and for the sake of your Son, that we might make use of your holy gospel and the holy sacraments, that through them we may have comfort and forgiveness of sin. Grant that your Holy Spirit might be might dwell in us that we may heartily believe your word and through the sacraments establish our faith day by day until at last we obtain eternal salvation through the same Jesus Christ your son our lord who lives and reigns with you in the holy spirit one god now and forever amen all other petitions we bring before you in the prayer your son has taught us to pray our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you His peace. Amen.
Thee we give all praise. With grateful hearts our voices raise. That angel host Thou didst create, around Thy glorious throne to wait. They shine with light and heavenly grace, and constantly nor sleep as we their whole delight is but to be with the lord jesus and to keep thy little flock thy lambs and sheep the ancient dragon is their foe his and We are so happy that you've joined us here for our online worship today. We invite you to join us here again next week online or to join us in person as we worship together, practice, still practicing stay safe social distancing. We gather at 9 a.m. for Sunday school and adult Bible class. Our worship service begins at 10.15 a.m. If you've enjoyed your time with us here today, Leave us a comment and let us know how things are going. But of course, we'd be even more happy if you'd share that good news with someone else, someone you care for. Invite them to worship with you next Sunday. If this happens to be your first time to worship with us, please like us on Facebook. Or subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you want to find out more about us, go to our website at trinitylutheran.cc. There you can find out more about the great people here at Trinity. Of course, we'd be more than happy to have you join us in person next Sunday morning at Trinity Lutheran Church, 1512 Louise Street at Avenue Inn in Rosenberg, Texas, where we continue to be a people praising God, maturing in Christ, and reaching others through the Holy Spirit.